the crushing of the Boxer Rebellion and the treaty that was imposed upon China in its wake were in some ways the last of the series of humiliations that the Western powers were able to uh, impose upon uh, the Qing dynasty. The shock uh, from this final blow was sufficient to rally uh, even the more conservative members of the Qing elite to a realization that something had to be done if they wanted to preserve their position, that uh, they needed to, uh, to make changes which they didn't particularly like, they didn't particularly find to be attractive, but which they came to finally realize uh, were, were simply a matter of survival. And the final decade of the dynasty is one in which reforms are adopted one after another, which would have been unthinkable and clearly had been unthinkable for these same leaders only a few years earlier. Perhaps the most remarkable of these uh, comes in 1905 when the Confucian examination system is abolished. The examination system had been operating uh, pretty much without interruption uh, since 1380 and of course had uh, uh, its, its origins, its, uh, its roots uh, well over 2,000 years uh, prior to uh, the, the, uh, its abolition. Uh, it had been the, the perhaps most important institution, the most important uh, cultural apparatus within China's political system, within the, the uh, intellectual life of the educated elite uh, for over a thousand years. And to have it simply be swept away uh, in, uh, as, a, as a political uh, uh, gesture in 1905 was a, a very, very dramatic uh, event. Many of the reforms uh, that had been proposed and adopted and then rescinded in 1898 were now once again put into place. Um, a blueprint for transforming the Qing state from an absolute monarchy into a constitutional monarchy to create organs of political consultation and participation uh, uh, for uh, new elite uh, uh, sectors in the, in the uh, cities and ports, uh, as well as the traditional uh, land-based uh, literati elite, was, uh, was developed. And a plan was uh, uh, adopted to uh, create uh, uh, provincial uh, assemblies, which would uh, actually begin to function by about 1916. These measures, however, uh, were not really uh, uh, sufficient to the situation. They, uh, they were developed and began to be implemented uh, in the years between 1901 and 1908. Um, but even at that time, there were already many in China who felt that uh, reforming the dynastic system was no longer the question and that really what was necessary was to begin to seek uh, some kinds of um, more radical transformation to put Chinese society, to put Chinese political life on a non-imperial basis, a non-traditional basis, and indeed to adopt Western-style um, political systems and political ideas to bring China into the modern world. Um, interestingly, at this time, we get a revival of uh, anti-Manchu ideas. Uh, the Manchus had been the rulers uh, of China since the conquest in 1644. Uh, I mentioned when we, when we talked about uh, the, the Qing conquest, the siege of, of Yangzhou and the, the massacre that takes place after uh, the city is captured. Beginning around the 1890s, the story of the siege of Yangzhou uh, begins to resurface, begins to be uh, reprinted and circulated amongst uh, uh, political, uh, in, in political circles. And a, a sense that the Manchu... Uh, conquerors are in part responsible for the weakness of China, that doing away with the alien regime, as it comes to be called, uh, is part of what's necessary to free China to be able to respond effectively to the challenge of, of modernity. This becomes part of the political uh, discourse and, and is certainly on the agenda uh, of many. And it blends with uh, the broader anti-Western, anti-imperialist 
uh, nationalism that was also uh, growing during these years. One individual uh, emerges as perhaps the most representative figure in the uh, quest for a radical alternative, a revolutionary solution to the problems facing China. And this is Sun Yat-sen. Uh, Sun Yat-sen, uh, even today, uh, remains uh, a, a very, very popular figure, uh, often referred to as the father of modern China. You'll see portraits of him uh, in, in public places, not only in Taiwan, where the uh, political organizations that he uh, had founded uh, continue to, uh, to be dominant, but even on the mainland, even in, in, uh, under the communist regime, Sun Yat-sen is seen uh, as, uh, as the great national hero. Sun Yat-sen was uh, actually born in the far south in Guangdong province near Hong Kong. He was educated uh, partially in Hong Kong, partially in Hawaii, which uh, at that time was still a, uh, an independent uh, kingdom. Um, his brother lived in uh, Hawaii, and uh, Sun, uh, as a young man, uh, spent time there living, living with his brother and, and uh, uh, going to school. In the 1880s, uh, Sun Yat-sen began to be attracted to ideas of radical change. He, uh, by virtue of, of uh, sort of having a position in, in both the, the traditional culture of China and uh, a great exposure to the ideas of, uh, of the West that he uh, saw both in the British Crown Colony of Hong Kong and in Hawaii, which, although still an independent country, certainly had strong cultural influences from uh, America and Britain. Um, he came to uh, believe that uh, the imperial system uh, held China back and that a, a republic, a modern Western style uh, uh, republican system would be uh, the solution needed to put China on the path of uh, modernization. In the 1890s, he began to build a uh, political movement, uh, an avowedly revolutionary movement, uh, aiming not to reform and, and adapt to the institutions of the imperial state, but to abolish them and replace them. Um, after the, uh, the defeat of China in the, the Sino-Japanese War in 1895, the failure of the reform movement in 1898, and the further debacle of uh, the Boxer Rebellion in 1899 and 1900, uh, Sun's ideas began to become more and more popular. Uh, many young Chinese, educated Chinese, turned away from the efforts to salvage uh, the, what they saw as the moribund regime of the Qing and saw Sun's ideas of a revolutionary transformation of China uh, as the way to go, as, as the more attractive uh, option. He puts together uh, in the uh, first decade of the 20th century uh, a sort of umbrella organization called the, uh, the Tung Meng Hui, uh, or the Revolutionary League, which brought um, anti-Qing uh, groups of a, of, a, of a range of ideas with a, with a range of particular political perspectives uh, together uh, to, to strengthen them by giving them a common uh, focus and a common program. He traveled extensively uh, within China uh, and increasingly outside China, around the world, speaking in public, uh, speaking to um, uh, overseas Chinese communities, and raising money. Uh, he was apparently a very effective uh, communicator, uh, did a very good job of, uh, of political agitation and propaganda, and was a, uh, a first-rate fundraiser. He probably uh, made his, uh, in some ways, his, his major contributions by raising money to support uh, various kinds of revolutionary uh, activities. Some of those revolutionary activities uh, took the form of military uprisings, or, or um, uh, at least uh, uh, violent popular uprisings, uh, against Qing uh, uh, government officials in various parts of China, particularly uh, in the far south. None of these, however, were successful. They all uh, uh, were rather, uh, uh, rather botched efforts, uh, and the the reputation of the nationalist movement, the revolutionary movement, uh, was, was certainly not uh, as, a, as a highly effective uh, uh, rebel organization or, or um, uh, 
uh, or a terrorist group, but rather as more as a uh, as a political movement. Uh, all these efforts to uh, to spark uh, a, a popular rebellion, which would overthrow the dynasty, uh, ended in failure. In 1911, however, uh, the dynasty does collapse, and uh, the way that this comes about was uh, was was rather uh, rather particular. The efforts of uh, uh, reform, which had been uh, put in place in the wake of the Boxer uh, Rebellion, uh, begin to stall out after 1908. In 1908, both the Guangxu Emperor uh, and the Empress Dowager, so she, die. In fact, uh, uh, they die uh, within just a few hours of each other, the Guangxu Emperor, uh, the evening before uh, the death of uh, the Empress Dowager Tzu Shi. And as a result of this, um, a little boy uh, uh, named Pui uh, is placed on the throne, and he uh, becomes uh, the last of the Qing emperors, uh, made famous, of course, by uh, Bertolucci's film of, uh, of that name, The Last Emperor. Um, as a little boy, of course, he didn't exercise any actual uh, political authority, and his conservative uh, uh, uncles, who uh, uh, constituted a, a regency council for him, uh, slowed down the reform program which uh, Tzu Shi had been presiding over. Uh, as a result of this, even the minimal progress that the Qing had been making towards uh, sustaining itself through, through political adaptation comes to a halt and the, the dynasty becomes, uh, uh, enters into a sort of final period of, uh, of rigidity. Within the dynastic system, however, there is one sector uh, where modernization and, and particularly modern ideas are becoming increasingly powerful, and this is the military. The military had been, of course, the subject of a lot of efforts by the self-strengtheners uh, in the 1870s and 1880s and into the early 1890s. And even after uh, the defeat of the modern uh, Chinese army by the Japanese in 1895, uh, there were still efforts made to develop a modern sector in the Chinese military. Uh, again, after the Boxer Rebellion, after the, uh, uh, the Eight Power uh, imperialist uh, army comes into uh, China in 1900, when it's withdrawn in 1901, uh, the Chinese army goes back on a program of modernization. And um, a very uh, somewhat puzzling figure, a, a certainly a critical player in this process, uh, is a man named Yuan Shikai. Now, Yuan Shikai, we, we met briefly earlier uh, in the context of the 1898 reforms. He was one of the Chinese officials who uh, turned against the reformers, uh, sided with the Empress Dowager Tzu Shi, and took part in the suppression of the reforms in 1898, which in some ways seems sort of uh, out of character, perhaps as a, as a modernizer, as, as an advocate of the modern army uh, within the Qing state, one would have expected to see him be on the side of the reformers of 1898. But for his own reasons, he chose not to uh, support them, and instead to ally himself with the conservative uh, elements amongst the Manchu leadership. Uh, but that winds up preserving his power and influence, and in the first decade of the 20th century, he is uh, one of the more powerful figures, and certainly one of the more powerful Chinese officials uh, within the, uh, uh, the Qing uh, government. In 1911, he comes to play uh, a pivotal role. The modern military, the modern uh, 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 units within the military, uh, had become a focal point for political activity. Uh, this in some ways was probably an unintended consequences of the efforts to modernize the army, but the officer corps in particular, and especially the junior officers, who were reasonably well educated, were exposed to Western ideas, uh, not just about uh, military affairs, but about history and politics, began to develop ideas of their own which were rather uh, radical and progressive. Um, the Revolutionary League, the Tong Meng Hui, uh, Sun Yat-sen's organization, devoted a lot of effort to trying to organize among the ranks of the junior officers in the army, and they were reasonably successful in doing this. 
Um, many junior officers joined the Revolutionary League. Many junior officers were involved in uh, uh, conspiratorial groups, uh, thinking about planning uh, different kinds of, uh, of insurrections. In October of 1911, one of these groups uh, in, in Wuhan, in central China, um, uh, was uh, plotting uh, some, uh, uh, some bombings, uh, preparing to try to trigger a popular uprising, uh, and their activities were accidentally uh, discovered. A bomb that was being prepared uh, by one of them within uh, a part of the city that was actually under the control of the Russians, it was a Russian uh, economic concession, uh, exploded. And uh, 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 unintentionally, it wasn't supposed to go off at that time. And as a result of that, uh, the authorities became suspicious and they began to, uh, to prepare to round up and arrest uh, 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 some of the uh, politically uh, outspoken members of, of, uh, of the, the army. Well, the, this triggered a, a sort of defensive move on the part of the radical soldiers and they launched a, um, uh, a sort of coup within uh, Wuhan and uh, uh, arrested uh, senior officers arrested some of the uh, uh, local uh, uh, representatives of the Qing government, the, the local magistrates, and called upon uh, the, the military and the, and the people to support them uh, in a rebellion against uh, the Qing dynasty. They proclaimed uh, a republic in the province uh, in which Wuhan is located, uh, uh, Hubei province, and they proclaimed the independence of that province from the Qing Empire. Over the next few weeks, uh, other military units in other provinces, particularly uh, initially in central China, but then uh, spreading to other parts of the empire, followed suit and proclaimed uh, their, uh, their independence, uh, disavowed their allegiance to the Qing state. Uh, these events were uh, were uh, largely spontaneous. They, they were triggered by this uh, accidental uh, uncovery of, uh, of, a of a plot in, uh, in Wuhan, uh, but, uh, but they, they, they spread quite quickly and, and began to be coordinated from one uh, location to another. Now, interestingly enough, Sun Yat-sen um, was not even in China at the time that this, uh, uh, this rebellion breaks out, what will prove to be the end of the, uh, of the empire and the, and the foundation of, of the republic, uh, the, the, the great uh, revolutionary leader wasn't even on the scene. He was actually in Denver, Colorado uh, when, the, uh, 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 when he received word of the, um, uh, the Wuhan uh, rebellion. He was on a speaking tour raising money uh, to uh, continue his uh, political work. He uh, sets out to return to China, not uh, one might think he'd go you know, back west to San Francisco and sail immediately across the Pacific, but instead he continues on around the world, uh, east across America, across the Atlantic, uh, to Europe, uh, speaks there a bit and eventually makes his way back uh, to China. He doesn't arrive back uh, in China until the end of December of 1911. Um, before he gets back, uh, as he is uh, making his way back and, and as events are continuing to develop uh, in China, um, the, uh, uh, the revolutionary movement begins to uh, realize that uh, uh, they are about to be successful, that the dynasty is in fact uh, on its last legs. And they need to figure out what, uh, what they're going to do about that, how they're going to uh, cope with the disappearance of, uh, of, of the Qing state. Well, this is where uh, Yuan Shikai uh, comes back into the story and plays uh, what becomes a, a very, very uh, critical and pivotal role. Now, Yuan Shikai was at this point uh, the commander of what's called the Beiyang Army. Beiyang means Northern Ocean, and it just simply refers to the, the modern military forces that are in Northern China. In that capacity, um, he was located, he was based uh, very close to the capital, and of course he had very good uh, political access uh, to the Manchu elite. So what Yuan Shikai does is to position himself 
um, as the middleman, as the broker between the revolutionary forces in central and southern China, who are, after all, uh, at this point, strongly based within the modern military. So he has, he has a natural uh, connection to them. And the dynasty, where he also has his, his political links. So Yuan Shikai is, uh, uh, is in an ideal position to be, to be the broker, to be the, 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 the intermediary between uh, the two uh, power centers uh, at this time. And what he does is to negotiate on behalf of the, the nascent republic um, the abdication of the Qing dynasty. Now, this becomes a very delicate process, and uh, Yuan Shikai is certainly uh, not acting as a sort of neutral and disinterested party. The natural expectation was that when Sun Yat-sen returned to China, he would assume the leadership of uh, the republic. He was the leader of the revolutionary movement. Everyone recognized and respected him, and there was a sort of expectation or, or assumption that, that he would step into the role uh, of, of the leader of the new government. Uh, and indeed, on January 1st, 1912, when the republic is formally proclaimed, uh, Sun Yat-sen is named as president. And he's going to, uh, uh, he, he, he is put in position as the leader uh, of the new uh, regime. But as part of the deal that Yuan Shikai negotiates with the dynasty, Sun has to agree to step down as president when the emperor abdicates and to allow Yuan Shikai to become president. And indeed, this is uh, exactly what happens. Uh, the, um, the emperor finally uh, abdicates uh, in February of 1912. Uh, Sun Yat-sen resigns the presidency of the republic, and Yuan Shikai uh, is named uh, to, uh, to assume that post. Now, the plan uh, in, in the winter of, of 1912 was that um, Sun Yat, uh, the, uh, Yuan Shikai's presidency was a provisional one. Uh, there was no constitution yet. There was no uh, institutional structure for a permanent government of the republic. And uh, the idea was that Yuan Shikai would serve as president during the period uh, when uh, the preparations would be made to establish a more stable uh, and permanent regime. The critical event in this process was the election of a provisional national assembly in the fall of 1912. Uh, because it was the duty of that body to then produce uh, a constitution. Uh, accordingly, uh, elections were organized and held, and um, Sun Yat-sen's group, which now uh, was transformed from the Tong Meng Hui, uh, the Revolutionary League, to uh, what's called the, uh, the Guomindang, the, the, people's, uh, the National People's Party, or the Nationalist Party, as it's more normally referred to, um, the Guomindang emerged as the clear victor, uh, uh, winning uh, the most seats in, uh, in the new assembly, and uh, uh, Sun Yat-sen was clearly positioned to uh, guide the party uh, forward in the, in the writing of a constitution uh, and probably then in, in leading uh, the republic. However, when the assembly uh, met, when it began to, uh, uh, when it was going to begin to deliberate um, the, the, uh, the, the future uh, of the Republic, uh, Yuan Shikai was um, unwilling to allow this process to go forward. Um, Sun Yat-sen had elected, had decided not to take a seat in the Provisional Assembly. He wanted to preserve his, uh, his special status. I think clearly he had in mind uh, keeping himself free to assume the position of president again. Uh, instead, the leader of the Nationalist Party in the Provisional Assembly was a man named uh, Song Zhao Ren. And Song Zhao Ren, when he was standing on the uh, railway platform in Shanghai, preparing to board the train to go off to um, take his seat in the assembly, uh, was assassinated. And it, uh, it, it uh, was quite evident uh, quite soon that this assassination had been orchestrated uh, by Yuan Shikai to eliminate uh, a strong leader on the part of the nationalists in the assembly. 
Uh, that was not sufficient, and indeed, as the assembly began its deliberations, uh, Yuan Shikai was uh, increasingly unhappy uh, with them and eventually dissolves the assembly, expels the nationalist uh, delegates from the assembly, and then allows a sort of uh, rump uh, uh, legislature to meet without the nationalists, uh, and that legislature approves a constitution under the terms of which uh, Yuan Shikai was named as president for life. Uh, so uh, the idea of establishing a, a constitutional republic with a, uh, an elected uh, assembly uh, goes by the boards fairly quickly, and the republic uh, uh, has a rather um, uh, abortive uh, launch. Now, Yuan Shikai's career is, uh, is not yet over, and he in fact um, remains as uh, uh, as president for three more years uh, 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 after 1913 when, when he dissolves the assembly and, uh, and, and has himself made president for life. Indeed, by 1916, by the spring of 1916, uh, Yuan Shikai had conceived the idea that he might uh, establish a new imperial dynasty. He has uh, robes made for himself uh, in, in the imperial uh, style. He um, assembles around himself a, a, a group of officials suitable to be uh, uh, a Confucian uh, imperial uh, cabinet. Uh, and in March of uh, 1916, actually uh, goes out to perform uh, some of the old imperial sacrifices at the Temple of Heaven uh, in Beijing and attempts to, uh, to proclaim himself emperor. Uh, but this is too much. Uh, even for his more loyal uh, followers. And uh, uh, his effort at a, uh, an imperial restoration with himself as emperor uh, collapses. He, uh, uh, he flees the capital uh, just a, a short time after this, uh, and uh, on his way south uh, uh, towards his, his hometown in central China, uh, he, he dies. Uh, ostensibly of a, of a broken heart at the frustration of his imperial uh, ambitions. Well, the death of Yuan Shikai, while in some ways uh, uh, certainly a relief, uh, in some ways a uh, uh, removing, uh, uh, could potentially have been seen as removing uh, an obstacle to the establishment of a viable republic, instead uh, proves to, to be only a further stage in the collapse of political authority in China. Once Yuan Shikai dies, uh, the last really strong, charismatic figure who had provided a sense of national identity, national cohesion, uh, and some substantive organizational uh, effectiveness uh, is removed from the scene. And what follows is a uh, a, a period of, uh, of about a decade during which China basically uh, falls apart. Um, military strongmen emerge in different parts of the country. Uh, some of them had been uh, uh, generals or, or high-ranking officers in the, uh, in the old imperial army. Uh, some of them were individuals who had risen to prominence uh, in the early years of, uh, of the Republic under Yuan Shikai. Others were simply individuals who seized the opportunity now to, uh, to, to grab power uh, wherever they could. And, uh, and warlords, uh, as they come to be called, um, established control all across China. Uh, there really was, from, from 1916 until 1926 or 27, no effective central government uh, in China. There was no uh, single capital. Uh, certainly Beijing uh, or Nanjing continued to function from time to time as the seat of, of governments that claimed to be the national government of China. Uh, but in practice, there was no such thing during this period. The warlords fought amongst themselves, sometimes forming alliances. Sometimes uh, those would break up and, and, and former allies would, would go to war with each other. And it was a time of great hardship great suffering in China. Um, uh, it was a time when the foreign powers uh, uh, continued to, uh, to enhance their own position, particularly the Japanese became much more ambitious in their efforts to uh, take over and control parts of China. And it was a time when uh, this, this process of, of humiliation and, and weakness and breakdown that went back all the way to the Opium War 
really reached its peak. Uh, out of that chaos, uh, and in the context of that chaos, uh, new voices, new ideas about ways to, uh, to put China on, on even more radical courses of transformation began to be heard. And we'll start to listen to those in the next lecture.